First of all, thank you everybody for coming <clears throat> to this uh, webinar series. Uh, this is going to be a webinar with Hugh Copperthwaite, and we are the main Aquaculture Innovation Center, um, or MAIC, and this webinar series is focusing on bringing aquaculture stories in Maine to you, specifically um, in parts that are funded by the Farmer to Farmer Exchange. So today, Hugh Copperthwaite from CEI uh, is going to be presenting on technology transfer. He has worked um, and collaborated with Maine Aquaculture in Innovation, Center, Innovation Center a lot on sea scallops and technology transfer. And this presentation is going to be showing examples of what is possible. Um, his work was in part funded by the Farmer to Farmer Exchange, which is still open. And this funding allows for farmers to travel um, and gather knowledge from other farmers around the world. And this funding is supported by the Northeast Aquaculture Conference and Expedi Exposition and the Maine Aquaculture Hub. So again, thank you so much for coming. Um, we're at Maine Aquaculture Innovation Center, and you can feel free to put all of your questions into the question and answer box at the bottom of the page, and we will have them available. We'll be um, asking them throughout. So thank you so much. And Hugh, over to you. Great, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining on this sunny day um, during lunchtime. Um, Today, I'm uh, just give you a little heads up on how I'm gonna approach this. I'm gonna talk about three different trips that I was involved with. Um, the first to Japan, the second one also to Japan, and the third one more recently to South Korea. And uh, I have about 65 slides and I do intend to take the just about the full hour. So if, uh, if my voice gets too much, feel free to just turn the volume down and just watch the slides or or whatever makes you happy. But um, I just wanted to uh, share some of the experiences I've had over the last 12 years or so around tech transfer. And I've uh, I'm a, I'm a firm believer that this is this is one of the fastest ways to implement a new practice or technology from one part of the world to another. And it's it's just, it's efficient. The learning curve is reduced very quickly. Um, and it's, you know, for, for not a lot of money, you can you can really uh, have some some big ideas come out of these experiences. So that's that's today. I, I'm probably not going to get into much about domestic uh, tech transfer, but but certainly that there's opportunities for that as well. Um, and I, you know, if there's time, I can touch on that at the end. But I don't have slides on that part. Let's see. All right. So. Again, my name's Hugh Copperthwaite. I work for CEI, Coastal Enterprises, Inc. We're a community development financial institution and we're located in Maine. So most of our work is all in the state helping with business development. And I work specifically with commercial fisheries and aquaculture businesses uh, and really trying to sustain those types of businesses here in Maine. And I first visited Aomori, Japan in um, 2010. You can see in the upper part of the slide, it shows Aomori Prefecture. So they use the words prefecture as the equivalent is of the state of Maine. Uh, so very far Northern part. And my interest was to look for other ways to sustain jobs here in Maine in this sector. And I think most of the people on the call probably know that, you know, lobster is our primary species for wild harvest. We're, we're 
very dependent on that species. Fishermen have traditionally had the opportunity to diversify their activities with different fisheries throughout the year, whether it's dragging for scallops or fishing for shrimp or sea urchins or ground fish. A lot of those opportunities have essentially gone away. And so my whole point of this is look for opportunity now because these, these projects take years. Um, they take a long time to develop and you know, with, with a changing climate and reliance on just a few species that you know, things could go south pretty quick if, if something happened to the lobster industry. So Maine has had a relationship with Japan. We've actually been working on trying to bring scallop farming to Maine for almost 25 years now. It's, it's a long-term uh, project. And I'll also say, you know, the kelp industry, which I'll talk about later in the slides, is also another industry that's relatively new. It's, you know, getting close to 15 years old here in the state of Maine. So those are two, two opportunities that I, I see and I'm spending quite a bit of time on. So back to Japan, Aomori Prefecture, very northern part, uh, it's just south of Hokkaido, uh, and these two prefectures are the top producers of scallops for, for all of Japan. You have uh, the Sea of Japan to the west, the Pacific Ocean to the east. Uh, Suguru Strait runs between Hokkaido and Aomori. And we, you know, if you overlay Japan uh, on the globe, sort of from a latitude standpoint, it the northern part lines up with basically from New York to Maine is where uh, Aomori and Hokkaido lined up. So it would only make sense that their climate and species and sort of economy might be quite similar to ours. And in fact, it is. Um, you know, these are these are very rural communities natural resource based economies tourism and you know seasonality they they you know winter in this part of japan is uh, some of the heaviest snowfall in the world happens here um so it it makes sense to look in this part of the world for opportunities and the way this japan opportunity came about uh some people who've heard me speak before will probably know exactly what I'm going to say, but to me, it all goes back to how did this come about? And it's the story is that the, a ship called the Chesborough was a trade ship that was built in Bath, Maine, and was off the coast of Almori, and it wrecked in a typhoon in 1889. So there were 23 members of you know, of crew and 19 of them uh, passed away in this in this wreck and four of them survived. And the four that survived sort of started this uh, incredible relationship that has been in place um, for hundreds of years now. So in uh, 1994, uh, the city of Bath, Maine signed a sister city agreement with uh, Suguru City in Japan. And later that agreement was more formalized into a sister state relationship with the state of Maine. And so there've been several delegations, uh, trips back and forth, school groups, cultural exchanges, art exchanges, energy, fisheries, you know, you name it, There's there's been an exchange. And it's just been an incredibly enriching uh, relationship with Northern Japan. Um, I was invited to go on a trip in 2010, uh, led by Karen Baldacci at the time, Governor Baldacci was uh, our governor in Maine. And the focus of that trip was energy and fisheries. And that's when I saw the scallop industry in, in 2010. There had been an exchange in 1999 
looking at the scallop industry. And that's why I say it goes back 25 years because that was one of the first uh, glimpses Maine had, <clears throat> excuse me, on that industry. <clears throat> so um, when I, soon after I got back from the trip in 2010, I started raising funds to take a group from Maine back to Japan to learn about uh, the scallop industry. And that's the, the list of folks on this slide and the, and the picture is, is the group of people that um, were able to commit the time to make basically a 10 day trip to Aomori. Um, and, you know, there was, there was quite a bit of thought that went into who should go and why. Uh, so MAIC was a partner, Maine Aquaculture Association, Maine Sea Grant, uh, Don Hudson with the Friends of Almori, uh, and then you know a series of growers and fishermen that we felt were, you know, would be the quickest to potentially adapt and and really push forward a scallop industry in Maine. So in October of 2016. We, we made the trip um, in our, uh, you know, basically took a bus to Boston, flew from Boston to Tokyo, got on a three, three hour bullet train from Tokyo to Aomori, and then, uh, you know, spent, spent the better part of a week traveling around the prefecture, uh, specifically focused on Mutsu Bay, which is, uh, it's about a 650 square mile bay that uh, has roughly three foot tidal range. And, you know, the water in Mutsu Bay has a residence time of about three weeks. And this is scallop producing grounds. It's, it's all about food production. This slide shows um, Dana Morse and Bob Brewer standing on a pile of Scallop shells, just kind of giving you a, a sense of the size of industry. And then Marston on the right, Marston Brewer holding a, a giant scallop. It's, it's a major part of their economy. And in Maine and other parts of New England, uh, you know, we're pretty much used to the adductor muscle of a scallop. It's, it's shucked at sea and the adductor is, is what we eat. And in Japan, they pretty much eat the entire animal and they prepare it in many different ways um, from steaming them, boiling, fried, individual, you know, wrapped scallops, like as a snack. We had ice cream. Uh, they also do quite a bit with dried scallops uh, in the upper right there. They do sell live on the shell in the market. Um, and, you know, cooked on a stovetop of a kerosene heater at one of the co-ops we visited. They also barbecue. Uh, we had potato chips flavored with scallops. So just about everything you can imagine, the, the Japanese get very creative and, and go for it. So while we were on this trip, our, our agenda, you know, I, I took about a year planning this agenda for a 10-week uh, initiative. And, you know, there's a, obviously a lot of logistics that go into that. But while we were in Japan, the whole point was to see scallop processing, visit the fishing cooperatives and, and meet with the fishermen. We spent quite a bit of time walking around and looking at gear, you know, looking at boats, uh, just really studying how vessels were set up. We did get out on the water. Uh, for a couple of days or a couple of opportunities. And um, that was some of the most revealing information we were able to, to see, um, you know, taking just many, many photos and videos. Um, and then the gear itself, you know, that photo in the upper right shows fat collection gear on the left, pearl nets, the ear hanging technique of growing scallops and then lantern nets. and Frankly, none of this none of this was happening in Maine at the time. Um, there'd been some experiments with bottom culture for scallops, some cage culture uh, opportunities. 
but the you know in Japan they have found that a long line system is the way to um, to grow scallops and this this is sort of a simplified diagram but it's basically a 200 meter long line so it's about 650 feet long suspended below the surface of the water uh, with a series of buoyancy floats and weights. Um, and they keep that line as tight as possible at all times. And from the line, they, they hang the various gear types. Um, this diorama we saw, you know, illustrates pretty well that, um, you know, shows that spat collection, pearl nets, lantern nets, and ear hanging can all actually take place uh, on the same lease site same uh, same location. And that might be different in Maine. You may collect spat in a different place from where you actually grow it out. But given the residence time in Mutsu Bay and the uh, you know high concentration of spat in the bay, they, they can actually collect it right on their farm site and go from there. So this is a little bit detailed and and you know, some of this presentation dives a bit deeper. I, I promise we won't go too deep, but this is this was really revealing for us from Maine to, to come and just see, okay, here's the production cycle. Here's how they map it out. This is this is how they do it. And the bars across the top are months of the year. So the green bars, the four, five, six, that's April, May, June, et cetera. And on the left side, the orange bars represent years. And so you can get into different year classes if you, you look at this chart and study it. But essentially, they, they set their SPAC collectors in the spring, uh, April, May. Once they've collected SPAT, they then deploy the SPAT into pearl nets in the month of July and August. And they, you know, the stocking densities are about 80 to 100 scallops per pearl net. They will then come back in the fall around October, November, which is, we were there in October, and they will go out and dump those scallops from those pearl nets, run them through a grader, sort them, clean them up, and put them in new pearl nets or clean nets while reducing the stocking density at that time. And that's critically important. Scallops don't like to be crowded. So that that's, you know, this is all there's all there's a very technical rhyme and reason behind all of this. And that's why when you see it and you can ask questions and understand it, it, it really makes sense. So end of the first year, growers then decide do I want to, uh, you know, put these scallops in lantern nets, or do I want to ear hang them? And so they'll make that decision at that point, and then you get into year two and three, where some harvesting may begin because they actually sell different animals at different times of the year into different markets. There's a, there's a, really a lot of opportunity for, uh, you know different markets and, and selling. Sort of like when we, you know, hard, hold lobsters and hold them for hard shell, um, or used to hold them on land in, in uh, uh, lobster pounds to, you know, to sell in the winter. It's the same concept. So this shows uh, some of the gear we saw on land, just uh, monofilament or some of the spat collection gear, the long line anchors they use, and some of the float uh, you know, long line floats they use, they actually do still use glass floats on, on some of these farms. We then uh, got into, you know, these were brand new pearl nets uh, being deployed in the fall for that stocking density reduction that I mentioned. And that is an electric net hauler on the rail. So it's simply to save your back and, and haul up these nets. Uh, because they do get quite heavy with fouling and as the scallops grow. That little lead weight is simply uh, to try to keep the nets vertical uh, when they're hanging from the long line as possible. 
this uh, just shows some of the steps of you know, bringing the nets aboard, dumping them into containers to then be graded uh, and put back into clean uh, pearl nets. The number four there, those were just sort of overflow that they were needing to store while they were uh, working with the animals. It's uh, critical that scallops are always kept in seawater, flowing seawater. You, you don't want to let them sit. They, they won't last long. They're not like an oyster or a mussel. Um, so that's you know, one of the real challenges of farming scallops is, is handling and making sure they're happy all the time. Uh, this just shows sort of the size that they were uh, grading during that October net change and one of the graders on the right. We also learned about lantern nets um, and a lantern net washer on the left. It's basically when these nets get fouled, you can lay them down uh, and run them through almost like a pressure washer from the top and bottom, this sort of conveyor belt mechanism that will uh, clean all the fouling off. And then lastly, we saw the ear hanging technique, which uh, is essentially drilling a hole in the hinge of an individual scallop. You hang them in pairs vertically in the water column, and you can see in that those two top photos, you can see how they're hung. And these uh, fishermen were simply uh, bringing these ear hang lines through a wash machine on, on the day we were there to, to visit. Uh, the gentleman in the lower right photo, the, the Japanese gentleman there, uh, is Mr. Sugiyama. His company actually builds the machines uh, in the upper right. And he was a real pioneer uh, with us here in Maine. We worked with him um, for about seven or eight years. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, a couple of years ago. But We've still maintained a relationship with his sons and uh, in their business in Amori. So a couple of thoughts just to think about when on a trip like this that, <clears throat> you know, we're dealing with a different species. So the Japanese scallop is the giant sea scallop, Yasinosis. The main scallop is the Atlantic sea scallop, Placopectin. Magellanicus, so different species to start with. We have a language barrier. You know, we, we're speaking English, they're speaking Japanese. I can't say enough about the translators who, who participate in these trips and help us, you know, have conversations. There's a time difference. Japan is 13 hours ahead of us. Um, so, you know, when communicating and emailing and such, everything, you know, there's a bit of a delay. There's massive cultural differences and business norms, you know, for us here in the U.S. and in the Japanese, and sort of learning that and understanding it is is really important for maintaining relationships. Different form of currency. They're using yen. We're using dollars. So, if we're trying to buy something, what's the conversion rate? How much does it really cost? The measurements. Uh, you know, talking about centimeters and millimeters, and we're used to inches and feet. Uh, and then you get into electrical requirements and sort of technical details of, well, how do we run this piece of equipment that works on a boat in Japan? How do we, how do we do that here in Maine? So the challenges are, you know, are there and it's constant hurdles, but um, a lot of people in Maine have really been pushing for a long time on this, you know, different areas of expertise and really trying to help move the needle to, to create this opportunity. This slide um, shows a series of pieces of, of equipment that uh, all of this equipment is now in Maine. And before 2016, none of this was here. So, uh, you know, through this relationship, 
we've developed business relationships over the years that's you know the business part has taken three or four years um and you know just building that trust with people getting to know them you know seeing them in japan hosting them in maine so you you're really developing people relationships and so the first equipment arrived we when we went to japan in 2016 i had raised some funds from the Maine Technology Institute to purposefully buy some equipment. So let's take a group to Japan, let's learn about this machinery, but let's actually buy it too and, and get it back here in the States. And so that's what happened. The, uh, that middle row uh, of equipment on the far left is a drilling machine for ear hanging. And on the far right is uh, that wash machine for ear hanging and two graders in the middle. And the drilling machine, the washer and the, the smaller grader, those all arrived in uh, 2017. So that's when the first equipment arrived. The Japanese were here when it was delivered. We set up at Matt Moretti's uh, shop at Bangs Island Muscle in Portland and started playing with it. And the rest is kind of history. Um, you know, this equipment has been used on multiple farms. Um, the, you know, CEI owns some of this equipment. Main Sea Grant, Dana Morse owns some of this equipment. The lower right-hand photo is Alex DeConing uh, at Hollander and DeConing Muscle. He bought a piece of equipment for, for ear hanging. Andrew Peters at Vertical Base Scallop owns some of this equipment. And the main aquaculture co-op uh, actually owns some of this gear. So we're all, you know, working on this, getting the gear here, uh, running trials. And this just illustrates the various sites along the coast uh, where some of these trials have taken place. Done, done quite a bit of work with Nate Perry at Fine Point Oyster on the front end when we were working with uh, Matt Moretti. Uh, the main scallop company was um, uh, Peter Stocks and Mark Green at the time had that company. Uh, of course, University of Maine in uh, the Darling Center, MAIC also in the Damariscotta River, Pemaquid Oyster Company, right up the coast with members of the Maine Aquaculture Co-op, Penn Bay Scallop Company is Morrison and Bob in Stonington, and then Vertical Bay is, is Andrew Peters in Belfast. So that's where this gear has been used. It's, it's still in use in many of these places. And um, I think, you know, back to my point about business relationships, we, you know, we want to be careful about what we buy and how we put it to use. And we want to take care of it. And you know the Japanese have a, a lot of pride in this equipment. It's it's wonderful. It's stainless steel. It works. It's sophisticated, and uh, we can't say enough good things about it. And so maintaining those business relationships are are really important. So all the time that this equipment has been arriving, we've also been looking at markets. So what are the markets for scallops in Maine? And early on, we did a, a market analysis of sea scallops with our Bouvier Consulting here in Portland. Um, and the, it looked very promising. So uh, that was sort of a, a study that's been done and is out there if, if you like to read about that and sort of understand the market for sea scallops. On the far right, is a cookbook that was put together by uh, Marson Brewer and Marnie Reed Crowell. So the whole idea was there was, well, what are people doing with scallops in other parts of the world? And if we're trying to introduce a farm scallop here in Maine as a premium product, how do we get people interested? So they wrote this cookbook and I helped with some funding to print promotional copies to be given away. 
So we we're getting those into hands of chefs, um, you know, some of the restaurants around the state, as well as um, some of the wholesale markets to to sort of get them interested in sourcing product. And I I think it's been effective. Uh, we we do have two farms in Maine now, uh, actively producing product and selling. Morrison Brewer at Penn Bay Scallop Company and Andrew Peters at the Vertical Bay. Uh, we also developed some uh, sort of how do you grow scallops information and put that in the form of an iBook chapter, which is still out there. Um, that work was funded directly by Maine Aquaculture Innovation Center. And it's it's pretty good. It's you know a lot of pictures, a lot of videos embedded in this document. We're now uh, MAIC is now working on making these iBook formats more into a web-based interface, which which should be um, a bit more user friendly and and accessible um, on down the line. So that's the end of that uh, trip that was in. 2016. Um, I'm going to keep going in the interest of time. I've got two more trips to talk about, and I'll I'll try to speed up a bit. But um, basically, you know, learned all about the scallop industry in Almori, and personally, I've had my eyes on Hokkaido, which is a little further to the north for quite some time, knowing that this is the top producing prefecture in all of Japan. They produce 90% of the scallops for Japan. And, um, you know, different techniques used there as well. So plenty to learn. And it, it just happens to be the top producing prefecture for sea vegetables as well. So kelp, seaweed, both wild harvest and farm raised Hokkaido is the place. Um, so I my last trip had been 2016, quite a bit of time of, of not traveling. Uh, you know, COVID certainly put a damper on a lot of that. But I was contacted by a gentleman from a company in Hokkaido and said, if you're ever here and want to, you know, learn about this, let me know. And a few months later, I was invited to speak at a conference in Sapporo. Uh, so I put those two opportunities together to plan another trip. And this time, the focus was Hokkaido and then back down into Aomori to revisit those business relationships um, to learn about the scallop industry, but also start learning about the kelp industry in this part of the world and invited Dana Morse to go on that trip for his, uh, you know, 25 years of pioneering sea scallop production in Maine. And also Andrew Peters and his wife, Samantha, um, because Andrew had not been to Japan and is, you know, he's really trying to make a business of growing sea scallops in Maine. And it just made sense to, to bring him on this trip let him, you know, get exposed to this. Um, and that's where some of the MAIC funds kicked in to, to pay for Andrew's trip, uh, which is great. So directly funding tech transfer. I had already had the trip planning underway and, and Andrew uh, was able to join us. So this trip took about 10 months of planning uh, for about two weeks in Japan. And Basically, I, I arrived on January 6th and came back on the 17th. Um, basically flew to Tokyo, flew up to Sapporo, spent, a, spent four days in Sapporo at the conference I mentioned, um, where I, I spoke about this project directly, uh, about tech transfer, all the work we've been doing with Aomori, and it seemed like uh, talking about that in Hokkaido uh, made sense. So that was my talk, a lot of what you've seen in the slides today. Um, when the conference ended, uh, 
Dana and I were traveling together at that time. Uh, we made our way up to Oturu, which is on the, the northern uh, part of, uh, you can see in that slide in the right, uh, Oturu is up on that northern part of the coast above Sapporo. Um, and just started walking around in the street, um, you know, visited some fish markets, uh, walked into a couple of kelp shops. They actually had stores dedicated entirely to kelp and sea vegetables, and they were incredibly helpful, willing to talk. Uh, the packaging is amazing. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to make a point to, um, to try to go back there with a specific mission uh, to learn about kelp. And that's kind of what I was doing, a little bit of a scouting session. Uh, the next day, uh, we woke up in Oturu, met up with Andrew and his wife and their son, Bowden, and went up to Yoichi, which is a little bit further left of Oturu, and visited the Central Fisheries Research Institute, which is the basically the regulatory agency that's in responsible for the natural resources in this part of Hokkaido. Um, while there, we were talking about uh, both farmed kelp and wild harvest, uh, understanding the different species and where it is grown and harvested around the entire prefecture. And we met with uh, Koji Mishiyoshi, or Miyoshi, who was a scallop biologist, um, really digging in a bit about bottom culture, um, scallop farming in, on the northern part of Hokkaido, where they basically collect seed by, you know, spat collection, but then they'll uh, release it back into the wild and let it, you know, free swimming. They'll come back and, and harvest it by drag. And the entire coastline is divided into different zones, very much like our lobster zones here in the state of Maine. And so the fishing cooperatives have exclusive rights to fish in those different zones. So it's kind of interesting that their farmed scallop industry is almost a, more like our wild fishery for scallops than, it, than our farmed industry. So pretty, pretty interesting and revealing to see that and learn about it. Um, this was our host in Hokkaido for a couple days. Hamano-san works for a company called Hamade. I'll talk more about them in a little bit, but they, uh, they build um, machinery for the scallop industry. They're uh, located in Hokkaido. And our first stop with Hamano-san was a a uh, sushi restaurant where they, uh, it's a conveyor belt sushi. And if you've never heard of this or uh, seen it, it's pretty cool. Uh, you basically sit down at your table, order off the menu, um, and there's a conveyor belt circling the restaurant that brings your sushi right to your table. Um, you can also just kind of look at what's going by and take what you want. Uh, so it's like self-service, but you can also order off the menu. It's it's a lot of fun. I bring this up because this is tech transfer. I think this would be a really cool business. Uh, so if anyone's wants to do, do something foodie, uh, check this out. It's it it's it's a new twist on sushi that could be a lot of fun. And the plates are different colored because depending on the color of the plate determines the price for that piece of seafood. So at the end of the day, you stack up your plates, the wait staff says, okay, you've got 12 yellow plates and six red ones, here's your bill. Very efficient, very simple, and a lot of fun. This is another thing I was kind of fascinated with, and it's a rice cake, it's a snack, it's very cheap, it's in every convenience store. It's basically a rice cake shaped like a triangle that has a sheet of nori wrapped around it. Um, and in the middle of the rice, 
they typically put some form of protein. So maybe it's salmon or tuna, um, egg, and you know the fillings get pretty creative. And like I said, you can you can literally walk into a 7-Eleven and buy this for like a dollar fifty. A couple of them will fill you up. They're very uh, satisfying, and you can see in the upper right the packaging. When you buy this, it's all wrapped up as one, but when you open it, you, you're not done yet. You have to assemble it a little bit. So you, you strip this paper away from the nori sheet, which is there to keep the nori from getting soft while it's wrapped up. And then you, know, you assemble it yourself. Uh, here's a 12-step process to do this. You can do it at home. I tried it. It's um, it's kind of fun. You can get creative and you can, you know, just buy sushi rice and the nori paper you can, you know, find online or some supermarkets carry it and just start experimenting with it. This slide is actually from South Korea, which is part of the end of my talk, but it was all over South Korea as well. Very popular. Um, you know, they got very creative. Spam, kimchi, fried egg, tuna, bacon, chili bean, pollock roe, like the list just goes on and on. So there's a food truck innovation idea. I'm telling you right now, could be cool to be able to buy that at a concert or something. All right, back to the wrapping up this trip. Uh, after support or after Oturu and Sushi, we went up Oturu and Yoichi. We went south to Tomokomai, which is on the southern part of Hokkaido. That was about a two and a half hour train ride. We used Google Maps constantly to navigate, to look up, okay, where am I? I want to go here, and it will tell you exactly when the next train is. Very efficient and, uh, and fun. So that was sort of a casual train ride. Uh, Scooby-Doo colors in the in the train car. <clears throat> that evening, just showing you sort of a food slide of, uh, you know, this was about a fifty dollar meal per person. So eating out um, is, I would say, for what you get is is relatively uh, not inexpensive but reasonable. You know, this is uh, shellfish cuisine. We had clams and a broth, octopus, mackerel, red snow crab, scallop. Uh, I'm not sure what the fish was in the upper left. I can't remember. And then, of course, seaweed salad. Uh, very, very fun and, and uh, personal delivery of that meal. So the, the last part of this trip um, in Hokkaido was... Uh, the trains were getting faster. They were getting more funny looking. Um, we took a three and a half hour ride along Funka Bay, which is a huge uh, scallop farming region for uh, Hokkaido. And we could actually see farms out on the bay as we were making this journey early in the morning. We then visited the Hokodate Institute, which specializes in uh, the kelp industry, as well as scallops for this part of the prefecture. Um, one thing I'll just point out is bringing gifts on these trips. It's not just a Japanese thing. I would say if anyone's going on some sort of trip like this to know who you're meeting with and, and bring gifts that are relevant to where you're from because it helps generate interest and an immediate bond and uh, sort of uh, warming up the conversation early on. I'll also say that um, I highly recommend business cards. I think with LinkedIn and email, a lot of people have sort of steered away from business cards, but on a trip like this, I would suggest a bilingual business card with English on the front and uh, the language of the country you're visiting on the flip side, uh, because it'll really help remember who you met with. Um, most of the people will, will have business cards 
and it's it's just a way to mentally keep track of things. So this is uh, Hamade. This is a huge company. Uh, they're headquartered in Hokkaido, in Hokodate, called Hamade. <laughs> it's a lot of H's, but they build uh, scallop machinery as well as squid and tuna jigging. They are doing about three billion in sales annually. They dominate about 70% of the global market for jigging machinery, and they're in 30 countries. And we got a meeting with them. And so we now have a relationship with this company, um, Hamano san who I mentioned earlier. Uh, he works for Hamade. He was just in Maine a couple of weeks ago. Some of you probably met him when we were showing him around Maine. But he was exploring opportunity for squid fishing in Maine, uh, but also Rhode Island. We spent some time uh, down in Rhode Island to make an introduction there where there is a squid fishery. Um, just a couple of last photos here from Hokkaido showing the, the fish market where you can uh, actually catch your meal um, by hand. Uh, that was kind of fun. And then down to uh, back into Aomori. So the point of this was uh, reinvigorate some of the business relationships we've had. So we went from Hokodate all the way up to Mutsu City. That was about a five hour train ride. Um, Re, you know, meeting with folks we'd met in 2016 who hadn't been to Maine since 2017. Um, uh, reconnected with Dr. Kosaka, who's a scallop biologist. Um, he's been a great help to us. He's been to Maine and we visited him a couple times in Japan. <clears throat> uh, this is one of the fishing co ops we visited in 2016. We went back and met with Mr. Tamura and his son. Um, we, they both, uh, or Mr. Tamura came to Maine in, in 2017. So just sort of rekindling those relationships. Um, this shows an underwater display of, of scallop farming uh, at the aquarium. It's just a, meant for display purposes. And then the Alga fish market is in Elmore City where you have both uh, fish, sea vegetables, everything everything right there for purchase. Uh, we were welcomed by the prefecture office. Um, they gave us a translator and transportation for a couple of days. Um, so that was great to uh, feel that sort of welcome opportunity. This is Keita Jin from Jin Fishing Net, also in Elmore City. First met him in 2016. They make uh, spat collection gear, pearl nets, lantern nets. And until this trip that we just made in 2023, we had not done business with Gin Net. We've now done business with them. Andrew Peters is, is buying uh, some, some pearl nets. So I just point that out because some of this stuff takes a long time, um, and this this was the right time for a business transaction for for Andrew. Uh, this was a scallop processing company we visited in 2016. Also, again, this last year uh, in January, and they were also part of the Japanese scallop pavilion that was at the uh, North America Seafood Expo in Boston a couple months ago. So just trying to trying to connect the dots whenever we can. This is another company uh, we visited in Elmore in January, a new contact. They don't have a website, they don't use email, they just build machinery. And so the net hauler on the right is something Andrew is buying and the net washer on the left is also something Andrew is pursuing buying. So from that trip alone, you know, we, you know, are doing business with three new companies, uh, you know, that 
frankly, dates back again to 1999 when all of this started. Last, lastly, just try to enjoy some of the culture while you're on one of these trips. Um, this is a Nebuta Museum, which is, these are huge floats. Essentially, it's like rice paper. They light these from the inside and paint them. And uh, once a year, they have a huge festival where they parade these through the street in August. Uh, this was the last dinner I had in Almori that night. Almori is known for fermented black garlic, which essentially it melts in your mouth. It tastes like candy. Um, you can sometimes you can find it at Trader Joe's in Portland. So if you're ever in there, take a look for it. Almori black garlic. And um, yeah, I know time is tight. I got about seven minutes. So this last part is about a recent trip to South Korea. I gave a lightning talk on this in five minutes. So I think I can do this. Um, and I think we can go over if anyone has time beyond one o'clock, the Zoom will keep going for, for any questions. So if you have to go, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's taken quite a while to get through this, but um, so this trip was recent in April of this year to learn about the kelp industry in the southern part of uh, South Korea. This trip was put together by the World Wildlife Fund, specifically Bailey Moritz and Molly Gupta. And they basically put uh, a group of 18 people together from all different parts of the world. Frankly, people were from Maine, they were from Alaska, British Columbia, uh, the UK, including Wales, Scotland, and England. And the whole purpose was to introduce this group to kelp farming in a part of the world where it's been happening for many, many years and you know, reduce the learning curve. So I talked to uh, Bailey early on when she was planning this. Paul Dobbins uh, also helped to put South Korea on the map for um, Maine and, and other parts of the world to you know, really focus on this, this area to learn from. Um, Jang Kim from Incheon National University was our guide. He was fantastic. Um, he had a loud voice that carried and could really uh, project and explain exactly what we were seeing as we made our way around the country. Um, the, uh, the trip was funded by the Builders Initiative and uh, Laura Rodriguez from Builders Initiative was also on the trip. So World Wildlife Fund organized it, Jang Kim led the trip, Builders Initiative funded it. Um, fantastic trip. We basically, um, you know, similar story. I got on a 15 hour flight direct from Boston to Seoul. Um, pretty remarkable you, when you can do that in an airplane nonstop. We then, uh, you know, everyone pretty much met in Seoul, uh, spent a day or two there just to sort of acclimate. I always recommend giving yourself a day to get there and a day to just chill out before your, your excursion really kicks in. Uh, and so we started the trip on a Monday. We boarded this bus for about five days to um, explore the kelp industry and, and headed south uh, pretty quick for, uh, I think it was about a six hour bus ride from Seoul to the Southern part. Our first stop was Jang Kim's laboratory at Incheon National University, excuse me, where we, we got to see his lab and meet with his students, graduate students working on uh, health production, seed selection. A lot of their work has gone into strain selection, looking for the best traits of different varieties of seaweed and kelp. And that's where the technology is. That's where the innovation is. Um, they've really, really refined this over the years. Koreans have been consuming kelp since the 15th century. So when you think about that, it's, you know, this is the place to go to learn about it.
And <clears throat> just over 20 years ago in 2002, uh, Korea joined the International Union for the Protection of New Varieties of Plants. Essentially, that's that's like putting patents on different strains of kelp. It's, it's that sophisticated in South Korea. And since then in 2002, um, they have uh, patented 19 different varieties of seaweed have been registered. So pretty remarkable innovation and technology. Um, and while the you know, the technology and the strain selection behind the scenes is, is very lab sophisticated. The actual farming and production is, is quite simple. Um, you know, basic elements like a knife and uh, the anchors on the right and outboard engines and, uh, you know, vessels with large open decks uh, to, uh, you know, be able to hoist uh, heavy material on and off these boats. <clears throat> a lot of the boats had that crane, that claw that could be used to grab a long line, but also pick up kelp and, and move it around. Uh, we went to a marine supply store and that was pretty revealing, just seeing some of the different fishing gear that's used, grappling hooks, anchors, different nets for different species of fish that are grown there. <clears throat> Lower right corner is a seeding, uh, a seed stringing machine that could be used on multiple farms to seed kelp lines. And then we did get out on the farms and see the different varieties of kelp. Um, so this was in Wando. We spent the day in the water. We saw four different species. The two upper right photos uh, are the right and the left photos is Saccharina japonica. So 60% of that kelp that they produce goes to feed the abalone industry, which is a shellfish. And I will talk about that on the next slide. Uh, the lower left is pyropia, which is essentially uh, sushi, sort of the, the seaweed snack wrap that you can buy uh, at the grocery store. That's a, a huge production species in this part of the world. Most of the, you know, if you go to Trader Joe's or Hannaford and buy seaweed snacks, look at the packaging, it'll say South Korea. Um, the lower middle photo is Gracilaria. Um, pretty amazing to just handle and touch that. And it's um, mainly cultivated and harvested for agar production, which is, a thickening agent or a food ingredient. Um, and then the lower right is sargassum, which is used mostly for food and cosmetics. All right, I know we're coming up on the end here. It's one o'clock, but I've got uh, about six or seven more slides. Um, this shows the abalone industry, um, which is also huge in South Korea. So these are floating cages, floating pens, where uh, the upper left corner shows that sort of net that sits down in the floating pen. Inside the net, they then put that black plastic, which is in the middle slide. That provides surface area for the abalone to graze on. And then they basically just drop kelp into these pens where the shellfish will, will eat it. Um, this barge in the upper right was, was feeding uh, the pens. The lower left photo had uh, just been harvested and they basically dump all of the, the entire contents of that net onto the deck and then sort of scramble through it and pick out all the abalone and uh, put, the, put the net back in the water. Um, <clears throat> I. I took this picture, these pictures just showing that these trips are very hands-on and that's the way I feel that you remember things. It's, it's a tangible experience where, you know, you're touching things, you're learning, you're using all of your senses from smell, touching, tasting, listening, 
and most of all, it's just visual. You're you're taking everything in to remember it. I took over a thousand pictures and videos on this trip. Um, full immersion experience is believing, um, and my you know my number one reason for talking to Bailey about going on this trip was to try to share this and and bring this back to Maine and and frankly other parts of the world where other delegates came from. Um, this shows a little bit of their nori production, or in South Korea, they call it gim, G-I-M. That's their word for nori. And the upper left is basically a large vat where the raw product comes in. It's put into these large vats where it's kept somewhat in suspension. And then it goes through a drying and pressing machine, the lower left. That machine is taking raw gim product, uh, extracting the water and pressing it into sheets of nori about the size of a standard piece of paper. They then bundle it, package it, um, put it in these boxes and it's held in cold storage for uh, inventory and sold uh, you know, throughout the year. This was a smaller production line of a private company where they were making seaweed snacks. So we we got to see, you know, from these paper sized sheets going through being flavored uh, with like a hot drip, uh, then dried, cut, packaged, labeled, um, you know, the whole the whole production we were able to see and they they, we were leaving the facility with seaweed snacks in hand. It was pretty amazing. This shows um, another processing facility where they were unpacking large four foot sections of dried kombu and they were trimming the ends off the four foot sections. That's what that red machine is doing. It's, it's cutting the ends off. Workers were then manually inspecting in that lower middle photo and scraping any fouling off the kombu. It was then heated. You can see the upper left photo. There's like a, a heat lamp where it's heated for a few minutes just to soften it up. And then it goes through a cutting machine and a conveyor, which is down on the lower right, um, made into uh, chips about the size of a postage stamp. Um, and some of this was then brought into the next room of this facility where it was ground into that incredibly fine powder uh, as a cooking ingredient. This, uh, this just shows a display that one company uh, set up for us. These are products that they are making and selling. Um, you know, seaweed salad, various seaweed snacks, seaweed chips. Uh, the packaging was incredibly impressive. There's a whole, there's a tremendous amount of pride that goes into this. Um, and I brought more seaweed home in my luggage than I did clothes. Um, so if uh, I, I had some samples at the recent seaweed symposium that was in Portland, Maine a few months ago, I will also have samples at the upcoming Seagriculture Conference in Portland in the fall. So if anyone uh, wants to stop by, I'll have some of these to give out. Um, just say that, you know, this was, this was an incredible trip. I simply got to participate in this one. I, I didn't do any of the planning. So hats off to World Wildlife Fund and uh, Bailey and Molly for, for planning that and for Professor Jang Kim. Um, they, you know, brought it to a as high a level as they could. I think when you can do that on a trip, sort of make it official, you know, visit the state capitol, um, that goes a long way because the host country um, has a lot of pride and interest in, in showing you the best. And it's reciprocal, you know, 
we will gladly host um, any any South Korean folks here in the state of Maine or or some of the other countries um, that were involved. And you know, you never know where the business relationships will go, but um, I'm pretty confident that that more will come from this. Um, again, just showing, you know, while you're on these trips, the food is just amazing. And that's that, you know, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about food and feeding people with, with aquaculture. So last slide, I think the key takeaways, you can you can read this, but look for opportunities to learn and leverage those connections, uh, whether it's you know state, domestic, or international. And don't be afraid to start small. You don't have to go you know to the other side of the planet to to find these opportunities. Um, you know, be patient, familiar side, familiarize yourself, and understand the culture where you're going. Um, one of the first things I do is I'll buy a map. I'll start listening to podcasts just to sort of start learning geography and how to pronounce things. Um, and if you're going to visit, certainly be willing to host a visit back here uh, where you live. And at the same caliber, you know, if, if you're treated to very uh, fine dining and experiences, just do your best to, to treat your guests the same way. And, you know, surprisingly, these trips don't have to cost a lot. You can really um, be efficient with planning. And again, it just reduces that learning curve. So there's probably some follow-up with MAIC. Um, they, they do still have some funds available. Um, and, you know, if anyone has any follow-up questions or wants to talk about a trip that you'd be interested in and doing, um, happy to happy to have that conversation. So I will stop sharing my screen. I think we're about 10 minutes over. And again, I'm sorry for that, but thank you all for, for listening. Thanks so much, Hugh. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, we have three questions. We can try to keep them short so that people can get going. But um, the first question is, what advice can you give the main seaweed farming industry based on what you learned in your trip? <clears throat> yeah, good question. Um, I think, you know, one of the number one things is markets and value-added products. You know, there's a handful of products being that are developed already here in the state of Maine by some of the innovative companies that have been in play for the last 12, 13 years. Um, but just seeing things that are for sale in other parts of the world and, you know, like that rice cake, it's, it's simple. It's a snack. Um, we're not, we're not growing nori here in Maine so much. I know there's been some effort. But, um, you know, I think that could be pretty cool to take an opportunity like that, a snack food, start to um, start with kids, you know, kids love seaweed snacks. That's the gateway right there. And when they start asking for it and the supermarket starts selling it, that's going to increase sales. Um, you know, some of the products Atlantic Sea Farms is rolling out. Ocean's balance, um, you know, that's that's great. And, you know, Bree Warner was on this trip and sort of thinking, well, what am I going to learn? What am I going to take back? And I think in the first day, she was like, geez, uh, there's a market here for me. You know, I can ship my product here. So it goes both ways. And uh, just, you know, Go for the low hanging fruit. Don't overthink it. And also, you know, the machinery is, it's expensive, but don't try to invent this. It's, it's probably exists somewhere else. And I'm finding a lot of the tech transfer, a lot of the aquaculture industry in Maine, the gear that people are buying is all, 
you know, no slam against engineers here in Maine or anywhere else, but it's coming from other places that that have already built the mouse trap, and uh, I think leverage that. You know, do it, buy it. We're we're buying some equipment right now from the Netherlands. The you know the drying machine that uh, Ocean's Balance just bought a couple months ago came from South Africa. Um, you know the tech transfer I mentioned about squid jigging in Rhode Island. You know there's things happening that that uh, are pretty exciting. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much for this presentation. It's been super interesting. Um, the next question is kind of in the same vein um, about the scallop side of things. So um, there's clearly a lot of overlap between like kind of similar environments as well as different species, but they're both scallops. Um, but this uh, guest was curious about what you've seen as the main avenues for main specific gear and grow out technique innovations in scallop farming. Um, so on the farm, like mm -hmm. equipment and grow out methods? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple approaches there. Like I said, there's there's been attempts at bottom cage culture. Um, Tom Pottle up in Eastport started doing that in 2000. He went on the trip in 1999 and immediately started trying to grow sea scallops up in Cobbs Cook Bay in bottom cages. Did that for a few years. Um, eventually didn't stick with it. But, uh, you know, the low hanging fruit with scallops is spat collection. So getting some Netron, some spat collection bags, setting those out in September, uh, just trying to sort of get your seed source started for your farm. And that gear is relatively inexpensive. It's uh, you know pretty pretty efficient. We don't have hatcheries in Maine for sea scallops yet, uh, so that is your seed supply. And starting with that, just see if you can get some seed going. Um, I'd say that the ear hanging pearl nets, lantern nets, that's that's not a small hurdle. That's pretty significant and. You know, that's why we we have two farms in Maine that are uh, using those techniques. Um, they, you know, they've studied it a lot, um, watched a lot of videos, uh, ask a lot of questions, sort of learning on the fly. But also when they see it in Japan, they can say, all right, well, in Maine, I would do it this way, a little bit differently. Uh, but it is, it's it's a steep learning curve. and. Uh, again, that equipment is huge because you gain efficiency uh, with braiding, cleaning, sorting, um, you know, cleaning nets. It's it all ties in. And don't worry about you know reducing jobs. You know, if you're going to buy a piece of equipment, don't think, oh, I'm going to put two people out of work. It's not going to happen. All right, and one last question. Um, what influence do you see the new concerns and emerging regulations on vertical lines and gear in the water column having on the growth of scallop farming in Maine? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, we're, we're certainly paying attention to that um, because it is more gear, more lines in the water column. Um, you know, I think, you know, gear loss is something we need to to pay attention to. If if one of these farms gets wrapped up in you know another use, uh, so I think you know this this scallops like deep water. You know, to to really have a good farm, you need at least sixty feet of water. I wouldn't suggest anything less than that because of that sort of footprint you need for setting up a long line. So putting these um, in areas where maybe you're sheltered near an island, uh, you're not out in the open ocean, I would not um, suggest these, these types of farms go out in those areas for, for those reasons. It's, it's, it's a lot of gear, it's vertical. So uh, finding places where maybe you don't have a lot of lobster activity, where you do have deep water, um, 
you know, you don't want strong current, you want some current, but uh, it's, it's something we need to do cautiously and roll out cautiously as, uh, you know, this, this whole industry is looked at. Great, thank you so much. I definitely learned a lot from this presentation. Um, we're gonna let everyone go now since we're at the end of our time, but thank you all for coming and just a plug for our next webinar on July 21st. Um, that's another Friday from 12 o'clock to one o'clock online. We'll be talking with Libby Davis about building wholesale oyster relationships with the Gulf Coast. So we hope to see you then. And again, thank you so much, Hugh.